talking about is the factors influence personal information management systems. What is it, why does it matter, and who cares about it? First and foremost, if you want to learn about my data and want to understand what my report's about, go ahead and talk to AI Michael. If you scan this QR code, my dissertation's been loaded up to an AI, and you can ask my dissertation any, any questions you want, and then we'll come back and give you answers. And this is thanks to Profina, who's going to be speaking next. Uh, as Lewis told us in the very beginning of the story, we stand on the shoulders of the giants that come before us. And so with that in mind, I have tons of acknowledgments that I want to put out and recognize for the research that I've been doing over, over the years. I've got my family, my committee, the GGU program, and my industry colleagues. There's at least 50 references to people's names in, uh, in my study, and my partners in crime with me, that helped me and were on this 20-year journey as we were pulling together our dissertation's work. Um, one of my uh, professors, the late Paul Fouts, said, you know, to be a doctoral candidate means that you're going to learn the history of the topic that you're looking to look, uh, work on and then drop your piece at the, at the very top. He also said to, and taught me to write is to think. And so this was a really exciting journey for me to go through this process. And so with that in mind, and as I was thinking, you know, I can reflect back to October 2005 when I had my Newtonian moment. And I was reading from a paper from John Dighton um, on market solutions to privacy. And he was actually talking about how personal data and our identities needs to be the economic asset of the individual that's about. And he can you go all the way back to his early research in 19, late 1980s, early 1991, where he was starting to establish this precedence in his study that this idea of personal data and identity is an economic asset that should be in the hold, holder of the individual and the data subject. And then thinking about what Paul Founce told me, that dropped me into this just massive rabbit hole that I spent 20 years digging myself into and then eventually out of. And I was asking myself questions about what does it mean for us to control our data? What is privacy? So what is it, why does it really matter anyway? And again, looking at this idea from going from history to current, I started analyzing all of the different data. And what I realized is that there, I came up with over 140 terms starting in 1892 to today. Uh, as, as late as last week is a new term that we were dropped in and what we've got, on what does it mean for us to have control of our data? What are the different tools and standards and technologies and concepts that we're relating to to give us control of our personal data and identity? And then this then brought me, as we think about this evolution, it, we, it, this evolved in four ways. The first wave was in, in that pre-internet stage. We were envisioning this idea of personal data and identity. And, they, and in 1890, um, Chief Justice and Warren Brandes in the United States said, we have a right to privacy. You know, and that furthered on to Brandes in 1928 when the Olmstead Act saying, we have a right to be left alone. Right? We have this ability to control our physical and digital selves. And then in 1946, Venner Bush comes up and says, look, I'm, I'm conceiving of this concept of a mimics machine, this idea where all of our information could be stored in this machine that we could you know, directly and wirelessly remote and access and be able to interact with our lives. So conceptually, this was going on for quite some time. And then finally, in 1973, there was a guy named Willis Ware who was advising the, uh, the, the U.S. government to develop the 1974 Privacy Protection Act. And he said, this data is so important that every individual needs a digital ombudsman. Basically, we need an AI that allows the individual to interface with the market. But that technology doesn't exist right now, so let's punt it to the future. Well, guess what? The future is now here. All right. The next wave, we go in. And we now start moving beyond the academic, thought-provoking thinking, and we get into actual more, more academic, more practical. So before it was more theoretical. Now we're getting into the academic. And in 1996, Kenneth Loudon proposes that we need a national information exchange marketplace. Yeah, and then we have Paul Trevevic, who actually in 19... 2003, 1997 actually develops the world's first PIMS that, that we actually had through his CLIPS Foundation. Um, and then we start moving forward, 2010 to 2020, we see all the regulations, everything we've been talking about, and there's so much little detail there. And then going 2020 um, you know, and going forward, I see this world of the meeting of the waters, where you have this traditional organizational-centric approach to data that we've been talking about all day long, now merging with this increasingly people-centric approach to personal data, giving people self-sovereign agency and control of their data. And the question that we're going to have is, much like in the Amazon, when these two rivers meet, the Amazon River and the Rio Negro meet, they don't actually merge for 3.7 miles. So you have two rivers li living in the same consumer bed of consumer engagement for nearly four miles. Now, how are we going to do this from an industry perspective? How many years is it going to take us to stitch this together? I argue it's going to be faster than we could possibly imagine. And we think about the role of our data. It actually, our data it actually happens at our conception. It happens at conception, at birth, play, education, work, transportation, health, money, tax, sex, religion, death, 
and even after death, our data carries with us. We need to be thinking about all of these activities and realize that going forward by 2025, they estimate that the average individual will interact with an IoT device every 18 seconds of every day. So your identity and your data is going to be interacting with an IoT device, either public or private, every 18 seconds of every day. How are we going to manage all of this data? And this is going to be important for both organizations and people. It's not just about the individual. As we talked about, there has to be value for industry as well. There has to be value for government as well. And misusing of this data creates anxiety. It creates loss of time. It creates loss of money. It creates re reputation damage. It creates fraud and identity theft. But it also leads to death. People commit suicide when their data is misused. People have tremendous amount of problems. They get stalked. They get murdered. There's a tremendous amount of issues that we need to do, consider. Not to mention the fact that we lose opportunity. When we do not have control over our data, we lose the opportunity of that data. And right now, that's being abdicated over to, the, over to industry. And Tim Berners-Lee, the founder of the internet, recognized this in 2017. That's why he created the Solid Project. And he says, we've lost control of our data, and we not, need to get to fix that. And The Economist brought this up, too. We need to un, un, unshackle this and give it back to the data subject. And my dissertation has over 40, 417 citations in it, but even Elastigirl said it, says it best from Incredibles. Your identity is your most valuable possession. Protect it, and if anything goes wrong, use your powers. Right? So what are our powers? Our powers are going to be this new and emerging piece of technology we call a personal information management system. Also, AKA, a digital wallet. It's what we've been talking about all day long. The wallet's just a small little sliver, though, that's sitting on the giant, broader pool that is my data. And I don't have the time to go into all the details of that, but I can, we can at a later date. And PIMS by another name. We've got all of these different number names. You get my dissertation, get all the literature, and read it, and read it, and go to bed with it. You, you'll love it. Which then brought me to my final primary research questions for the study. What are the factors that will influence people's intentions to use a personal information management system, and how will those factors influence actual use? Um, I did a mixed method study. Um, interviewed 2,608 people throughout the United States. Um, learned a whole bunch of stats that I never thought I'd ever need to use, but it was actually quite interesting. Um, did literature. Uh, honestly, when you look at PIMS adoption studies, there have only been 12 up until now in the history of all of the billions of dollars that we've been investing in this. There's been tons of technology studies and implementation studies and blockchains, this is and that's, but there's only been 12 studies that, that I've been able to find that have looked at that said, why are people going to want to use this? What influences, to, what influences them? I used uh, the uh, uh, Agile and Fishbind Reason Action Approach, and I looked at basically trust, attitudes, subjective norms, aka social influences, and perceived behavioral control. The sense, do I think that I can actually do this to see if that would lead to behavioral intention? And then does behavioral intention lead to actual use? And the answer I found above the board is yes. Right. Trust is the highest predictive value. If I trust the tool, if I trust the provider, if I trust technology, I'll use it. If I believe that technology will help me, I'll use it. Um, data experts, news about data breaches, people I follow on social media, and trusted advisors are my social influences, not my employer, not a whole bunch of other things that I found. Um, and then do I, do I think I can learn it, and do I have the confidence to use it? That's what I've learned. The other thing is I looked at a whole other areas, 30, 34 to 44-year-olds, or 45-year-olds. 150 to 190 income, education, some college and above, and then a variety of other different background factors all led to our intention to actually use this PIMS and then actually have actual use. I then looked at, 12, because I had enough data, I broke all this, the data up into 12 different cohorts by age and income and experiences and such, and I found that you know, what really would drive people to want to use these tools, these 35 to 45 year olds, this 150 to uh, you know, 999K uh, people, um, protection utilities. Password managers, identity and credentials management, what we've been talking about all day, antivirus tools, online behavioral monitoring, and then what Eric was just talking about, and what uh, uh, John and Bruner in his panel was talking about, verified sender information and content authenticity. Right? So my study backs up everything that we've been talking about all day long. Um, tons and tons of use cases are in my dissertation. And I could even put more in from what I learned about today, but I'm not going to because I'm done. Um, and then finally, you know, there's, uh, there's about 50 or so providers that are out there in the market right now uh, that have been evolving. We've got Data Sapien and a handful of Profina and a, half, and a handful of others that are in the market. You can look at all of those within the study, too. This is one of the most comprehensive studies that has uh, this type, uh, type of data in the market. And then our path to market, where do we go from here? Right? Well, where we go from here is I think it's going to kind of be uh, evolutionary. You know, the first step, is, and, and yet revolutionary at the same time, as Andrew Budd opened up with us this morning. Um, first, it's going to be an embedded approach. 
Secondly, it will be an interoperable service approach. Like we'll get PIMs in our cars because our car can produce about $40,000 worth of data today, which is not being given to us. It's being taken by the car companies. So there are things like that that we need to learn. PIMs will go in the car. We'll filter the data through us. And then finally, you'll start getting interoperable services through all the protocols and APIs that we've been talking about all day. And then ultimately, we'll have marketplaces. You'll have like the SMP, SMTP, like Wendy was talking earlier, the Global Acceptance Network of Data. That will allow us to happen. And that's how this market will envision and evolve. And, so we, and then where we're at is right in this early stage of an embedding stage at the beginning of the solution. So where do we get from here? Embrace PIMS. Realize that we need to be of service to the connected individual. Prepare to connect with the individual on the individual's terms of access, not our terms of service. And then prepare for change. And I'll leave you with this. Darwin taught us this. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but those that are most responsive to change. And we, we are about to see a ton of change in the market. And so with that in mind, I'd like to we'll go ahead and get my contact information. If you email me, I'll be happy to send you a copy of the dissertation when it's public. Um, and I want to bring up our next panel right now. With